October the 30th, 1961. The Soviets are about to test the biggest bomb the world has ever seen. Russia's nuclear scientists worked under constant threat of imprisonment and death. They created the most terrifying weapon in history and were hailed as the saviors of their country. But they paid a huge price for their patriotism. Some lost their lives, others their freedom. Eight hours train ride from Moscow, the track is blocked. Ever since the 1940s, the region beyond has been sealed off from the rest of Russia. Every single carriage has to be searched. Inside the wire, a city with no name. It appears on no maps. Signs on the boundary warn those who come this far. It's a forbidden zone. Officially, this is postal district number 16 of the town of Azamas. The residents call it Sarov, the name of the ancient religious site on which it was built half a century ago. 50 years ago, one of those who made the journey here by order of the Soviet authorities was Yuri Trutnyev. No one would tell him his destination, but there were rumors. We young specialists, we don't know. I go to the sitting next to me. Please, we don't go to Sarov. He was scared, so to speak, and he didn't answer anything. Sarov's closely guarded secret, betrayed at peril, was its nuclear weapons labs. Here under Stalin's orders, scientists were working feverishly to make the Soviet Union a superpower. But scientists like Trutnyev willingly submitted to this iron regime of secrecy. I can't от того, что э, необходимо было стране. Мы не так были воспитаны. Лично для меня э, и интересы страны, интересы обороноспособности страны были на первом плане. И не только у меня. Я должен сказать, что все физики, которые, с которыми я работал э, в институте, э, я знаю, что это все были патриоты. The new secret city was Stalin's answer to America's atomic headquarters at Los Alamos in New Mexico. It had risen from nothing in a few years, thanks to slave labor. The slaves were thousands of political prisoners shipped in to Azamas 16 from the gulags of the Eastern Urals. The resources of the communist state were being deployed as a matter of urgency. In August 1945, the American atom bomb had devastated Hiroshima. Stalin immediately realized just how vulnerable the Soviets were. His nation's future was at stake. The atom bomb project was top priority. To run it, Stalin appointed Lavrenti Beria, chief of the secret police, the dreaded KGB. One of the most feared men in the country, he'd been in charge of Stalin's purges as millions were killed or sent to labor camps. In 1945, Stalin gave Beria an ultimatum. Build an atomic bomb in five years, 
will suffer the consequences. Берия, конечно, личность одиозная, к нему относиться можно по-разному. Но неоспорим тот факт, что Берия был выдающийся организатор. Берия faced a daunting task. Much of Russia lay in ruins after four years of bitter warfare. The country was on its knees. The Americans assumed the Soviets wouldn't be able to find the resources needed for full-scale nuclear research. But they'd underestimated the power of the KGB, and of Moscow's command economy. The government, which controls all the resources of production, can concentrate all the efforts that are needed to achieve a high level on a particular area. Beria at once ordered the respected physicist Igor Kurchatov to gather together the best brains in the country and build the Soviet Union's first atomic bomb. Beria now had the money and the scientists he wanted. But to meet Stalin's five-year deadline, he also needed the services of someone working at the heart of the Western nuclear project. His name was Klaus Fuchs. A brilliant German physicist, Fuchs had fled the Nazis and settled in Britain. During the war, he'd been sent to Los Alamos to help build America's atom bomb. Unknown to his superiors, Fuchs was also an ardent communist who'd fed secrets to the KGB while in America. Returning to Britain after the war, Fuchs began work on the atomic project at Harwell. Alexander Feklisov, a top KGB agent, was dispatched to London to act as Fuchs's key contact. Fuchs would hand him British and American atomic secrets to be relayed back to the Soviet Union. I understood that the task of working with Fuchs was more complicated with any agent I worked before, more important, and I took it to my heart I was preparing to each meeting very meticulously. To avoid detection, the pair would meet at predetermined locations around London. Feklisov was given strict instructions by his superiors. You take care that when you're going to meet him, you be absolutely sure that you are not followed by the British counterintelligence. And not only you, but you have to see that when Klaus Fuchs came, that he didn't bring a tail with him. He said, I am in, uh, in a position to know everything, what is done in Harwell. And uh, uh, I, I participate in all discussions, not only in Harwell level, but on the government level. Only one Soviet scientist was allowed to read the intelligence reports from Fuchs and Beria's other spies. At a house outside Moscow, Igor Kurchatov would pore over the stolen documents. Klaus Fuchs passed on a stream of detailed calculations, designs and diagrams, which enabled Russian scientists to forge ahead with their nuclear program. Kurchatov would review the documents and issue instructions to his scientists. If they hit a problem, he immediately referred it to Beria's KGB network, leading back to Klaus Fuchs at Harwell. One of the greatest obstacles was how to transform uranium into the plutonium the Soviets so badly needed as a fuel for the bomb. Klaus Fuchs gave them the answers. He said, here is the material about the production of plutonium. It will be produced in wind scale. He said, now you have everything to produce atom bomb. Uh, he said, but I understand that you and me, we are treading fields full of mines. 
one wrong step and we will blow up to bits. <laughs> and uh, I am ready to sacrifice my life. Protected only by canvas, the Soviets could now start to build their first nuclear reactor. Inside, they followed Fuchs's instructions to the letter, assembling layers of graphite rods to control the speed of the nuclear chain reaction, which would turn uranium into plutonium. The moment of truth was at hand. Failure could mean death at the hands of the KGB. Khrushchev's reactor is still on view, two floors underground. In memory of the first Soviet atomic pioneers, the reactor is started once a year. The clock is kept at 5.59 p.m., the exact moment one evening in 1946 when Russia's first nuclear reactor began to produce plutonium. Khrushchev's men had taken a giant step forward, but they soon faced a new danger. A backlash against any form of innovation was sweeping through Soviet science, led by the reactionary Trofim Lysenko. Lysenko was kind of tsar or dictator in Soviet biology. And instead of the uh, studying uh, real science, he sometimes created uh, theories, uh, sometimes wild theories, uh, and he was able to uh, kind of explain them in such a way uh, f that for some political leaders they, they, they look as very convincing. Lysenko's theories whipped Stalin into a fervor against any new developments in science. The first casualty, genetics. All people who did fight against Lysenko, they've been arrested and uh, disappeared. So uh, this already created uh, uh, atmosphere of fear. It didn't take long for Lysenko to switch his gaze from biology to physics. They tried to declare that uh, Einstein theories of uh, uh, um, relation between mass, energy and, and space and so on also are idealistic and this made uh, nuclear scientists uh, vulnerable because they've been working on the basis of the, all these theories. But even Stalin had to bow to the superior knowledge of his physicists. Чатов обратился к Сталину и просто с, э, и сказал, что если э, будет разгром физики как биологии, то Советский Союз не будет иметь атомной бомбы. Ну и гонения прекратились. The Soviets had the technology and raw materials to make an atom bomb. A young engineer, Boris Smagin, was ordered to the new site in 1947. Much much of the technology was salvaged from the military in a bid to save time and costs. Kurchatov's team knew they had to build the atom bomb in the next three years, or else. Corners were cut, sometimes fatally. My work is always connected with unexpected pressures. We always had to solve something at the last moment, something didn't have to be done. I usually do many hundreds of hundreds of hundreds. That is, a large number. And when there is a large number of such dangerous work, it is easy to be wrong. It is just a potential danger. But in fact, there were very sensitive capsules. 
Вот, то есть достаточно, ну вот заряд, который находится на теле человека, был достаточно, чтобы взять его в руки, и он взорвался. И это действительно реально происходило. No cost was too great. In the decades that followed, many of the scientists paid the price of working with untested radioactive materials. Лаборатория, где я вот делал одну из деталей, скажем так, атомной бомбы, была расположена в отдельном корпусе, был шестой корпус, на окраине всей территории, потому что мы работали с довольно опасными веществами, вследствие чего большинство сотрудников нашей лаборатории, к сожалению, рано погибло. И осталось вот нас двое еще в живых. By July 1949, the team at Azamas was ready to test the bomb. At a Politburo meeting a few days before the test, someone asked Stalin what would happen if the bomb failed. His reply: "We can always shoot the scientists." Вообще ситуация была очень тяжелой. Если бы первая бомба не взорвалась, то, скорее всего, всю эту группу могли расстрелять или вообще ничего посадить. И у них уже была запасная команда. Уже там в Арзамас. At the test site, project leaders Hariton and Kurchatov waited anxiously. With less than 10 minutes to go, Beria turns to Kurchatov and said, "Nothing will come of it, Igor." He was wrong. Мы сделали экспериментальную вещь и передали его, естественно, для серийного производства. Поэтому было чувство облегчения, чувство очень большой радости за то, что мы сделали, и гордости за нашу науку, за наших руководителей, за нашу страну. Kurchatov's team had done a good job for the motherland. Inside the museum at Azamas 16, they keep a replica of the first Soviet atomic bomb. It was identical to the bomb dropped by the Americans on Nagasaki, and it had been delivered one year ahead of Stalin's deadline. In the aftermath of the explosion, it was time for celebration and the granting of awards. Beria decided that those who would have received maximum prison sentences if the bomb had failed would receive the Order of Lenin. Those who would have been shot would now become heroes of socialist labor, like the project's leaders, Kurchatov and Hariton. News of the Soviet bomb reached the West even before it was announced in the Soviet Union. The American response came from a Hungarian refugee. We must conclude that 10 years from now, Russia will be way ahead of us. I say that this will happen, not unless we do this or that. I simply say it will happen. As the Soviets tightened their grip on Eastern Europe, Edward Teller saw Russian communism as the new threat to world peace. In response, he wanted to build a superweapon to keep the communists at bay. Till now, both sides had relied on fission, splitting plutonium atoms to release energy. Teller's idea was to fuse hydrogen atoms together to make a bomb of unlimited power. Afraid of being left behind, Stalin ordered the KGB to find out about Teller's research into the new weapon. Agent Veklisov asked Fuchs for information. When I brought and sent it to Moscow, it appeared that it was detailed information how to create a hydrogen bomb. The new information was another KGB coup. But to outstrip the West, the Soviets would also rely on a young physicist of genius. At the time this film was shot, Andrei Sakharov was an unknown physicist. 
Within months, he was to transform the arms race and become the father of the Soviet H-bomb. Charged with building the hydrogen bomb for Stalin, Sakharov joined the prestigious group working at the laboratories in Arzamas 16. By the time he got there in 1950, Arzamas had changed beyond all recognition. In a few years, the Soviet state had transformed a desolate area into a thriving nuclear city. In propaganda films, life inside the atomic cities was portrayed as a happy collective. The nuclear scientists were some of its most respected residents. One of the privileges enjoyed by Sakharov and his team was something other Soviets could only dream of. They were allowed to read Western journals. Американские ученые вроде не просто были на службе своего правительства, они высказывали свое мнение, что вот, вот это сделал, это не следует. Были споры между ними, которые выплескивались на вот, странице этого журнала. Это производило очень сильное впечатление и толкало на размышления о том, что... The bulletin of atomic science was not just a way of finding out how Western scientists expressed their opinions. В них не публиковались только самые секретные, непосредственно при, э, примыкающие к, к ядерному оружию вопросы. Остальные, так сказать, публиковались. Мы могли, так сказать, пользоваться этим вот фундаментом, работать, развивать науку и, и прилагать ее к, вот, к, к делу создания атомной бомбы и водородной бомбы. Because of Beria's insistence on secrecy, Sakharov's team were unaware they were already working with top-secret reports on America's H-bomb fed to them by Fuchs. Also unknown to them, Teller's early work was flawed. They struggled to make it work. Then came Sakharov's breakthrough. Instead of placing the hydrogen inside a tube, like the Americans, he decided to layer it, just as in the Russian pastry cake, the Sloika. Это была очень красивая идея, которая значит, была принята абсолютно всеми, как очень красивая, как новые, все были, это было даже понято руководителями проекта и Берия, так сказать, когда это доложили, что, что это некоторый совершенно ну, другой путь решения проблемы создания водородной бомбы, который ну, означал некоторый выход ну, из тупика. For the first time they devised an original, entirely Soviet design. But on the other side of the Iron Curtain, an event was taking place which would intensify the nuclear arms race as never before. On January the 27th, 1950, the mid-morning train left Oxford. On board was Klaus Fuchs. Waiting to meet him at Paddington Station was a police inspector. Alexander Feklisov had no idea the arrest was imminent. I've decided to walk to the Soviet Embassy at Kensington Palace Garden, and I came to the newspaper stand, and I see Fuchs is arrested. Me. I continued my walking very quietly. I was very sorry, because we achieved the already love that he gave everything. He gave atom bomb, secret hydrogen bomb. 
The channel of nuclear secrets from Harwell to Azamas was suddenly closed, and now the West knew Fuchs had been betraying them for the best part of a decade. Klaus Fuchs, genial. И вклад его самый значительный из всех агентов, которые в этом направлении работали. Это бесспорно. То, что без него бы решили эту проблему, это тоже однозначно. Просто потребовалось бы много времени и сил. The news rocked America. President Truman ordered work to start immediately on the hydrogen bomb. Further realistic comment is added by General Leslie R. Groves, who was the wartime chief of America's huge atomic energy program. We must maintain our lead in the atomic field. We must not ignore the hydrogen bomb. The race with the Soviet Union was on. By 1952, two years after getting Truman's go-ahead, the Americans had solved the problems with their early designs and were ready for a test. Their first hydrogen bomb looked less like a weapon than a large shed. It weighed 65 tons. The test in the Pacific vaporized the whole island. It was the biggest man-made explosion in history, a thousand times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. Reports of the American test were fed back to Moscow and rushed to KGB headquarters in the Lubyanka. Beria was shocked. At an emergency meeting with the scientists, he demanded they show the world that the Soviets also had the H-bomb. We thought that we are now going to do the same thing as they do. И Берия сформулировала такую задачу, что это нам очень важно, что по некоторым дошедшим до нас сведениям американцы занимаются подобного рода исследованиями, опытами. И, нам, и задача успешного завершения работы над слойкой и ее испытаний является ну, важнейшей задачей, которая ну, должна быть решена ну, как говорится, любым образом. But just when their country needed them most, the nuclear scientists faced a new threat from Stalin. At the end of 1952, he ordered Beria to round up dozens of Jewish doctors he suspected of plotting to kill him. Many of the leading physicists at Azimuth 16, like Yuli Hariton, seen here on the right, were Jewish. They knew this meant the beginning of a state-run anti-Semitic campaign. Был какой-то вот период, месяца два, когда как-то очень напряженно. И я не исключаю, что могли заменить даже, ну, что-то Лаврентьев был, Вильюшин. Э, э, ну, целый ряд академиков прислали, может быть, даже хотели заменить тогда. But fate would intervene. Before the purge could gather full momentum, Stalin died. The country plunged into a state of mourning. Nikita Khrushchev soon emerged as the new leader. The scientists could relax and move ahead with the test of their first H-bomb. Thousands of miles east of Azamas 16 on the edge of the Russian steppe, a handful of troops, all that remains of the military presence in Kazakhstan. Named in honor of the leader of the Soviet nuclear project, the town of Kurchatov borders the largest Russian nuclear test site. Now virtually deserted, these hotels and apartments were once home to hundreds of scientists and officials eager to know if their bombs worked. In 1953, Kurchatov recruited locals to help set up the test site for the H-bomb. We knew it, we didn't know that it was Kurchatov, we knew it as Borada. 
Вот борода должен приехать. А как только сказали борода приедет, значит взрывы будут. То у меня мать работала на секторе, ухаживала за этими в аптеке, за животными. Здесь же на площадке этих ставили животных, там и баранов, и лошадей, и особенно собак на испытания ставили. Along with the animals, dozens of planes and tanks were laid out as if ready for action. Buildings were constructed to test the full force of the explosion. The Soviet military, as well as the scientists, were keen to study the new superweapon. Vadim Logachev was a 23-year-old army lieutenant. His job was to measure the levels of radiation after the blast. Today, he's returning to the site for the first time in 45 years. We lived in conditions of cold war, which did not exclude, in any way, the possibility of the development of a hot war with the possible application of nuclear weapons. The experiments of nuclear weapons had a very large, not only a military weapon, but a moral significance for maintaining the spirit, the mood, the mood of the citizens of our country. Потом уже как-то обнимали друг друга, поздравляли, и потом быстро перебирали в своей памяти, что же нужно делать, потому что нужно ехать на поле, делать это нужно быстро, потому что эта работа велась в условиях радиоактивного загрязнения, довольно высокие уровни радиации. Когда тут появились спустя некоторое время после взрыва, и когда смотрели на эти разрушенные мощные сооружения, то действительно приходилось просто удивляться этой очень большой колоссальной силы ядерного взрыва. Но одновременно и признаешь ее, в общем-то, с таким страшным явлением. Конечно, если бы нам пришлось где-то с этим практически столкнуться не на испытательном полигоне, а, возможно, вот в условиях применения ядерного оружия. Unlike the Americans, the Soviet scientists had made a weapon so small it could be dropped from a plane. This was the world's first deliverable hydrogen bomb. Sakharov was 32 years old. I regarded myself as a soldier in this new scientific war. I had no doubts. Оперативный дежурный капитан Сергеев слушает. Есть. Anticipating a new era of nuclear warfare, the Soviet government began to prepare its people. But to keep up with the Americans, the Soviet Union needed bigger, more powerful weapons. Sakharov suddenly abandoned the Sloika in favor of another new design, one he hoped would create a bomb of unlimited power. Первым водородом заряде в Слойке сжатие термоядерного заряда самой Слойки производилось взрывчаткой. Для того, чтобы получить большую мощность. Нужно было либо увеличивать размеры, либо больше взрывчатки использовать. Конструкция становилась совершенно не э, такой нерентабельной. Надо было найти был источник энергии, который позволил бы сжать сильно. И вот, естественно, появилась мысль об использовании энергии э, ядерного взрыва обычного для обжатия э, термоядерного заряда вместо взрывчатки. As the scientists traveled to the test site in Kazakhstan, tension was high. Their new hydrogen bomb worked in theory. Now they'd see if Sakharov's gamble had really paid off. Перед испытаниями в памяти перебираешь, почему может быть плохо и в чем может быть дело. 
В общем, беспокойство за судьбу испытания. While the bomb was being prepared and loaded at a nearby airfield, the observers were split into two groups. The politicians would watch from the town border. The young scientists were told to stand much closer. Например, в отчетах я прочитал такие вещи, что ожоги ожидались на расстоянии до 30 километров, а мы были как раз на границе этой зоны. Ну и потом на меня произвело впечатление, что вот, скажем, когда я прочитал что последние подопытные животные находились дальше нас. Правда, они были без очков. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Первое ощущение нестерпимого жара, как будто бы вы на несколько секунд поместили лицо в открытую печь. Кажется, что облака движутся и исчезают. И Крутящийся столб, ножка гриба поднимается. Мы вскочили, но нас уронило еще один или даже два раза, вот я сейчас не могу точно вспомнить, отраженными ударными волнами, которые были настолько сильны, что значит, были способны уронить человека. 70 kilometers away, the shockwave and flash shook the town of Kurchatov. This secret footage was taken to show the Soviet government. You see a group of people standing on the road. This is where the shockwave is about to hit. They are far away from the place of the explosion and are feeling quite safe. But they are about to pay for their complacency. You stood up too soon, my friends. Now you are going to have to lie on the ground once more. Мы все скачали с криками ура. Сзади меня бьет доведенка физика. Ну молодцы, теоретики, молодцы, теоретики. Поступила команда ехать. Мы поехали в городок. Значит, нас сопровождала эта черная туча все время. Это помню, что по капле дождя. Из нее покапали. Было ощущение, что, может быть, это что-то радиоактивное. Когда мы въехали в городок, то там были выбиты стекла, значит, двери были тоже, в общем, вылетели. То есть, как действительно при настоящей бомбардировке. Ну, конечно, настроение было приподнято, то есть были все в каком-то осознании, то, что участники все-таки такого исторического великого события, как говорится, то есть прежде всего как торжество физики. Пришли мы в гостиницу, Андрей Сахаров, Курчатов, Харитон, Зельдович там совещаются, а мы, значит, вестибюль ждем, что будет. Ну, наконец, они выходят оттуда. Значит, обнимаемся, целуем сахар сверху. Так он говорит, и от них уже коньячком попахивало. Ну, то есть они правильно сделали, выпили в честь этого. But the jubilation was short-lived. Some of the physicists were deeply shocked by the very power they'd unleashed. Kurchatov himself began to argue for a ban on further tests. In 1958, at the Soviet Assembly, he made an impassioned plea. Я выступаю на этой сессии от имени советских ученых, в том числе и от ученых, занимающихся вопросами атомной энергии. 
Kurchatov implored the scientists of the world not to use nuclear energy as a weapon of destruction. For Sakharov, this was also a turning point. He calculated that for every megaton of explosive, 10,000 people would suffer the fallout. The H-bombs he was designing were three times bigger than that. We had created a terrible weapon, the most terrible weapon in human history. But over the next few years, his concerns were ignored. In 1961, Khrushchev ordered him to create the biggest bomb he possibly could. On his return to Arzamas 16, Sakharov gathered his team together. One of the participants of our colleagues at this conference невольно, как-то спонтанно спросил, Андрей Дмитриевич, а зачем нужно такое людоедское оружие? Андрей Дмитриевич, мягко улыбаясь, как-то виновато, ответил, Никита Сергеевич сказал, пусть эта бомба висит над капиталистами, как домоклов меч. Это, с одной стороны, покажет возможности нашего принципа, который мы заложили в 53, 55 и 58 году. А с другой стороны, это будет до известной степени предупреждение миру, куда может привести гонка вооружения. On August the 13th, 1961, the Berlin Wall went up, a powerful statement of Cold War intent. But Nikita Khrushchev had one more surprise for the West. И завершим это испытание взрывом э, э, атомной э, водородной бомбы мощностью 50 миллионов тонн протила. Спасибо. Мы говорили, что мы э, имеем бомбу 100 миллионов. Это верно, значит, я подтверждаю. Но 100 миллионную бомбу мы взрывать не будем. Потому что если мы эту бомбу взорвем где-то туда, куда она предназначается, то мы можем и себе окна побить. Поэтому, значит, это не стоит. Khrushchev knew he'd never used these super bombs against the Americans. They had no military significance. Sakharov repeatedly begged him to stop the tests. The response was short and brutal. Хрущев сказал, что на самом деле существует только одна политика, политика с позиции силы, и я был бы слюнчай, если бы слушался таких, как Сахар. Then in 1962, the Soviet military decided to test two similar super bombs. In the desolate wastes of the Arctic, preparations were underway. The giant bomb was assembled in a workshop on top of a platform car. A few days later, the platform was coupled to a train to take the bomb to the airfield. As the generals gathered for the test, Sakharov frantically tried to stop it. He told Khrushchev that exploding a second bomb was not only unnecessary, it would be murder. Hours later, Sakharov discovered that the first bomb was already airborne. Afraid he might get the test stopped, the military had speeded up the schedule. It was the ultimate defeat for me. A terrible crime was about to happen, and I could do nothing to stop it. I was overcome by my impotence, unbearable bitterness, shame and humiliation. I put my face down on the desk. Sakharov had been defeated by men who'd grown more powerful thanks to the weapon he had created. It was a demonstration of force, a card in the superpower game of mutual intimidation. Гонка, которая развернулась между Советским Союзом и Соединенных Штатов Штатами Америки в этой области. Она уже тогда оказалась чрезвычайно опасной, и что рано или поздно может просто получиться неожиданная даже катастрофа. 
Лично для себя я в конце концов заключил, что я не могу продолжать участвовать в этой работе. Для того, чтобы самого себя убедить, правильное ли решение я принимаю, я начал как бы письменно дискутировать сам с собой, потому что обсуждать это с кем-то посторонним я не имел возможности. И вот в случайно чудом сохранившихся записях личного характера у меня был и такой фрагмент. И сколько бы ни звучало в оправдании, а вось так оно и надо, а вось это единственно возможное, если хочешь уничтожить зло на земле, нужно помнить, что возможно более действенное средство, и нужно как можно быстрее убираться прочь. For Sakharov, too, it was time to leave Azamas. In August 1969, he collected his books, handed back his keys, packed his bags, and left. Мы, конечно, чувствовали, что Сахаров теряет, но он был не переклонен, он хотел уехать. Throughout the 1970s, Sakharov continued to speak out against nuclear testing. By the end of the decade, he'd been stripped of his awards and exiled to the closed city of Gorky to live under constant surveillance by the KGB. On December the 23rd, 1986, Sakharov was finally allowed back to Moscow. But Sakharov had never been a normal scientist. A sick man, he now devoted his remaining few years to the democratic cause. Many of his colleagues saw things differently. To this day, some of them still live and work inside the closed city of Azamas 16. Ощущение спасения России за счет работ тех лет сейчас единственное, что удерживает Россию от того, чтобы ее окончательно разодрали, это наличие ядерного оружия. East and West have long since agreed to end all nuclear testing. But in Stalin's atomic city, nuclear patriotism lives on. <laughs>